I want to talk to you this morning about the precious blood of the Lamb. Uh, take it from a scripture that uh, in 1 Peter that we're not redeemed by the blood of lambs and goats, which was the Old Testament standard, but by the precious blood of the Lamb. Precious blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There's an incredible power in the blood. It goes all the way back to the beginning. And uh, even when the first uh, martyr was slain for the gospel, when Cain killed his brother, it says his blood cried out from the ground. And the reason the blood is important because fallen man lost all authority over Satan and we became the servants of sin. And it's been restored by the work of Christ. And we'll look at a scripture in Revelations 12, 11 says, And they overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and the word in their testimony. And the reason both those things are important because the word of God is the sword that we hold Hebrews says it's more powerful than a two-edged sword. And I heard uh, somebody say the significance of that is it cuts both ways. It's us speaking the word of God gives us authority over Satan. It's the word of God that gives us life. It's the word of God that gives us authority. And the Bible says to hide God's word in your heart so that you won't sin against God and to give us power and strength against the devil. So I've got... Uh, over 20 scriptures I want to share with you. I probably won't get to them all today. I'm going to try and get at least half, though. The blood of Jesus does more than 20 things, amazing things for us. Number one, it remits or pardons our sin. Matthew 26, 28. Jesus told the disciples at that last supper, this is my blood, a new testament, a new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of their sins. It remits our sin. The Greek word there could also mean pardon, and that's a word that we understand and we use. We have uh, presidents who can pardon people. Uh, I think governors can pardon under certain conditions. But the most incredible pardon of all is from God himself, who's the judge of heaven and the judge of all of us. A pardon. What does a pardon do for someone? If they've been convicted of something, if they've uh, pled guilty to some crime, a pardon overturns that conviction and lets that person go free. Now it doesn't change the fact that they were a sinner, doesn't change the fact that they committed the crime, but a pardon says you are no longer responsible for the consequences of that act. Now that's an incredible thing for us because we are all guilty, the Bible says we have all sinned, come short of the glory of God. So we all start in the same place. We're sinners, and only when we come to Christ as Savior and Lord, the Father then grants us a pardon which forgives us and frees us from all the consequences. We're still guilty. We've still committed the sins, but we've been pardoned, and we've been set free from those consequences. They've been nullified. That's an incredible thing to have in our past. That's the beginning, but there's some more incredible things than that that happen. Because at that same time, it gives us eternal life. I talked about this last week. Those who drink my blood, those who receive that cleansing that comes from my blood, says I will give them eternal life. Leviticus said that human life is in the blood. God doesn't have blood. I don't believe God has a human body that's uh, subject to the same limitations we are. But we were created in his likeness and his image. And we exist spirit, soul, and body. And the life of the body is in the blood. And so there's something to do with the blood that when man sinned and judgment was pronounced on his life, that it was only blood that could provide a covering or um, a remission from those sins. And I believe the first animal sacrifice was conducted by God himself because when they lost the glory and realized that they were naked, it says God made, made them, doesn't say created, God made them 
coats of skin to be a covering. Well, those skins would come from an animal. And in order for an animal to give his skin to be a covering, it had to die. I believe the origin for that sacrifice came from God himself who made the first sacrifice and Adam passed that on to his son Abel who then made a sacrifice of a lamb and we'll talk about him later. But there's something to do with the blood and I don't know if it has to do with sin nature being passed on but I know that we are born in sin. We are born in sin and the blood of Jesus takes that away not only pardons us from that sin but promises us eternal life. Not in these bodies. See, if Adam and Eve hadn't sinned, they would have lived forever in those bodies. Uh, that would have been different because without sin, there wouldn't be disease, there wouldn't be cancer, there wouldn't be all of the decay and destruction that we have in the world. But God's original plan was for Adam and Eve to live forever. Because he said, let's take out the tree of life unless they eat from that and live forever. How terrible would it be to live forever in this sinful body? Anybody wants to spend another hundred years in theirs? Uh, we're all wearing down. And so the blood provides us the promise of eternal life, not only to be born again in the spirit, not only to have our mind and our souls renewed, but we have a new body ahead. And so it's the blood that pardons us from sin and it's the blood that gives us the promise of eternal life. Number three, the blood causes us to dwell or abide in Christ. He said, if you drink this blood, if you apply this blood as cleansing to your life, it will bring you to a place where I am living in you and you are living in me. Our eternal life is going to be the most intimate communion and fellowship with Christ because everything that he is we're going to share and we're going to have and right now we have Christ living in our hearts and our spirits but in eternity we are going to dwell with him being a part of him and him being a part of us we're going to have the mind of Christ the Bible says and we are going to have that intimate fellowship I believe that God gave marriage between a man and a woman to be just a little bit of a prototype of the incredible relationship that we're going to have with him as the bride of Christ. And he said, because of my blood, my life is in you and your life is in me. And we have that promise. And that's because of the blood. It causes us to dwell in Christ. Number four. The blood is the means by which Jesus purchased the church. Acts 20, 28, uh, it says, feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. See, our life is not our own. When we purchase something, well, let me ask you an example. Brent, if you purchase something at Walmart, do you leave it there or take it home? The idea is if you purchase something, it is yours and you have the right to take it home. And that's what Christ has through us. We've been purchased by the blood of Christ. And he said, I'm gonna go prepare a place so that where I am, you will be with me also. We have been purchased. So the church is the bride of Christ. We've been purchased by his blood and his plan is to take us to his home to live with us forever. We have been paid for, we have been purchased um, from who? Who have we been purchased from? Satan. From Satan. Because we were born in sin, we were born in his family. Jesus told the scribes, the Pharisees, said, you are of your father the devil, and his works you will do. So we were all born into the family of Satan, and we were his possession. He had control over us. All of us lived our lives and were born under uh, that control of sin nature. But Christ's blood has purchased us, paid the price, so that we no longer belong to Satan. We now belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are his possession, we are his purchase. And he did that on purpose. Joe, do you buy things that you don't want? When you buy something, it's because you want it. The point is, 
When you see something that you like, you purchase it. And you purchase it because you like it. And if you've been purchased by the blood of, blood of Christ, it's because he likes you. It's because he wants you. It's because he was willing to pay the price that you would be his possession. He wanted to take you home to be with him. He likes you just the way you are. I mean, do you walk through Walmart and say, oh, well, if, if you guys would fix this up, if you would change this or this or that, I'll come back later and maybe I'll buy it then. You take it the way it is. Either you like, it's, it's as is a lot of times as you're shopping. And the Lord took you and he took me as we are. You don't have to fix this up. You don't have to change this by that. He took you as you are. In fact, the fixing's going to happen after he takes you and after he gets you home. Then he'll make us what he wants us to be. And we'll be willing to make those changes. But he bought us and he purchased us just the way they are. It says, honor God. Therefore, with your body and your spirit, which are God's. I noticed a word there that I hadn't noticed before. Honor God with your body, which is created by God, which is God's. Honor God with your spirit, which is God's. Because if you're born again, that spirit of Christ that lives in you came from God. You are every bit his prize and his possession, and he loves you very much. Number five, the blood is the means by which Christ became our atonement through faith, Romans 3, 25. Now this is a, a Hebrew word that goes back to the Old Testament. There were sacrifices that were atoning sacrifice. Um, we sometimes use that phrase here, even in our English, about you have to atone for your failures. You have to atone for your mistakes. What does that mean? Pay for. Pay for. There's a consequence. You have to atone. Pay. There's a consequence for it. And you have to atone, make a, a payment for it. Well, this word in the Greek, atone, talks about and has a connection, a very real connection to the mercy seat in heaven. And Christ's blood is the atoning sacrifice that paid for our sins. I, you know, the previous verse said that he purchased the church with his blood, and he did that. I mean, when you walk through Walmart and you pick out, I want this, I want that, I want this, you don't just plain take it home because you wanted it. You have to go through the counter, it's scanned, and you have to make a payment, make a payment. So Christ loved the church, and it says he gave himself for the church, and the price was his own blood, his life, his death on the cross, the three days that he spent in hell for us, and this blood is like the money, the price, the purchase that had to be made for our lives. And where did he make that payment? He went to the mercy seat in heaven. There's a tabernacle in heaven. The tabernacle that Moses made, the tabernacle that Solomon built, the temple that Herod built are all designed after the pattern in heaven with an outer court, a holy place, and a holy of holies. In the outer court was the altar where sacrifices were made. In the holy place was a place for the bread of fellowship, the incense of worship, and the candlelight of the Holy Spirit. But in the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant, two angels with their wings spread over that mercy seat, because the lid on the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat made out of gold and the high priest would go in there once a year with the blood of a lamb and sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat to atone to pay for the sins of the people for one year Hebrews says that the blood of Christ cleansed us not just one time for a year that had a sacrifice that had to be made over and over and over again. But the blood of Christ made the purchase, the atonement for us, one time, one time. 
So after his death, resurrection, Mary was clinging to him, and Jesus told Mary, don't cling to me. I have not yet ascended to the Father. That trip to heaven that Jesus was talking about was to sprinkle his blood on the mercy seat in heaven. That was the checkout. That was the place where payment was made. And so then he came back uh, to collect his prize and to take us into fellowship with him. Atonement is an incredible thing, and I, I hope you catch that picture, because it's the blood that was the atoning sacrifice, the payment that actually made the purchase of our lives and the church to be the body of Christ. Payment was made. Number six, the blood justifies us and saves us from wrath, Romans 5.9. Romans 5, 9 says, being now justified by his blood, we will be saved from wrath through him. Justified by his blood. And the importance of that, being justified, is we're saved from wrath. Remember, in the beginning, we were pardoned from sin. We had this death sentence hanging over. Whosoever sins will surely die. Surely die. And it's the soul that will die and spend eternity in hell. That's the payment for our sin. But Jesus made that payment, and the proof of that was his blood that was sprinkled on the mercy seat. And by that blood and by trusting our faith in that blood, it brings us to a place where we're justified. It's more than being declared innocent, because we were sinners. We were born in sin. We had a sin debt hanging over us. We were pardoned from that sin debt. But now to be justified, well, one explanation I heard put it this way, and I like it. It's just as if you'd never sinned. Now, how can that be true? How can that happen? How many of you have committed more than 100 sins in your lifetime? We all have. We all have. So how can the Bible say it is just as if we'd never sinned? That was a part of our history. That was a part of our past. That was a part of our lifestyle. How can that be forgotten, erased, because it happened. Here's the answer. Because when you choose to receive Christ to be your Lord and Savior, Romans 5.17 says you become a new creation, a brand new person that never existed before. And the old is passed away. So, in Christ, you are a brand new person, and not only is your past forgiven and your pardon from the past, you become a brand new person as if it never existed before. And that's how it's just as if we'd never sinned. For example, when a new baby is born, 10 seconds in, how many sins have they committed? They're born in sin, but they haven't committed sins. When you are born into Christ, you are a new baby in Christ, and now you are born not with the sin nature, you are born with God's nature, and you've committed no sins. And your mind says, yeah, but what about the sins we commit after we're born into the family of God? And that's true. But we'll get to that because the blood of Jesus is so important that after you've been born again into the family of God, you are this new babe in Christ with no sin history. You're a brand new person in Christ. Whatever future sins the body commits, the blood cleanses. Whatever sins your soul commits, the blood cleanses. See, we just sang a song. There's power in the blood, in the blank cleansing blood of the Lamb. Soul? There's power in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the... And that's true for us as a believer. You're a new baby born in Christ. Your past is forgiven. And now, any sin in our life is covered by the blood. It's a perpetual cleansing in the eyes of God. We are declared righteous, just as if we'd never sinned. 
Number seven, the blood of Jesus Christ redeems us. Ephesians 1, 7. We've been redeemed. Redeemed. Anybody here ever collect green stamps? you remember those? Or there was gold bond stamps, I think, and I don't know. Different stores had stamps. And so you had all of these stamps, and eventually when you got a book full or so many books, you could go and redeem them, use them to pay the price for something else. Redeem. Another meaning of redeem, um, I won't have you raise your hands, but you all know how it works. If you've ever gone to a pawn shop, something is pawned, means you've lost possession of it, and by their taking possession of it, you have a temporary benefit that has to either be paid back or you lose the item that you pawn. That similar situation has happened to us as believers. We were born in sin and we were pawned or ownership was claimed to us by Satan and unless the price was paid to redeem it back, it would be lost and belong to Satan. See, because God created Adam and Eve, they belonged to him. But when they sinned, ownership, possession of their lives went to sin and to Satan. And unless the price was paid to buy them back, they would be lost and belong to him. So everybody in the Old Testament was saved by faith, looking forward to a redeemer who would come and pay that price. An example of that is Job, who was in terrible situation in his life, but he said, I know this, my redeemer lives. An awesome song. I know my redeemer lives. And even though sitting there on the shelf in the pawn shop, Job could say, I know my redeemer lives. And that one day he will come and redeem me from this curse and I will be free and belong to him again. That's what redeem means. We've been purchased from Satan who had a claim over our life. The price has been paid, the blood of Christ that brings us back into fellowship in the family and the house of God. These are incredible words of what God's done for us. We've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That price was paid and brought, it bought back our freedom from the sin and from the curse of sin that hung over our lives. Number eight, the blood of Jesus grants us forgiveness. In Christ, Colossians 1.14 says, in Christ we have redemption through his blood from the, even the forgiveness of sin. Forgiveness of sin is freedom from accountability. Forgiveness of sin. We use that word in, in finance sometimes. What does it mean to forgive a debt? There was a, a debt that was owed, and there was payments that had to be made. But if someone forgives the debt, that means that no further payments are required. You are set free from being accountable to make those payments. And I think this is something that's so important uh, in our lives to know that we've been freed from that accountability of sin. Satan, I believe, uses our sins, either past or, or even the current ones, now that we've committed as a child of God, as a clutch to beat people over the head. Well, if you were a Christian, you wouldn't do that. Well, if you were a child of God, you wouldn't think this. Well, if you were God's child, you wouldn't have these feelings rise up on the inside of it. See, we have forgiveness of sin. Not only the past ones, but even the current ones. And that's why this cleansing from the blood is so important. Freedom from accountability. Uh, and it's awesome to know that our sins are forgiven. And, and so many people know that and believe that and they receive that. For example, Billy, if you pray and ask the Lord to forgive you of a sin, 
How long do you think it takes him to do that? Just a second. Right there. You ask, he forgives. Mm -hmm. The Lord doesn't say, okay, I'll forgive you, but you got to do this and this and this. You got to make this payment. I remember a time when I'd done something and I was talking to people and asking for prayer and, and advice, and a man told me this. Well, if you've done something stupid like that, you can't really expect the Lord to help you out of it. And I thought, yeah, I, I know. Because that guilt hit me, yes, I know, I did a dumb thing, I, I know, it was my fault, I made a mistake. And okay, so I made a mistake, and even the Bible, the scripture, I think Satan uses against us, you reap what you sow. When that person said it to me, automatically guilt came to my life, yes, I know, I messed up, I, I did something bad, and yeah, I deserve to be punished and be in the place I'm in. And I went home and I thought, no, 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 I'm not going to agree with that. Because when I've done something stupid, when I've made a mistake, or when I've sinned or come short of God's glory, that's when I need forgiveness more than ever. That's when I need to know that I've been pardoned. That's when I know that I... I need to know that I've been redeemed. I need to know that I've been forgiven and set free from the consequences. Now, there are consequences in this life. If you go out and borrow too much money, you're going to end up paying it back. If you smoke all of your life, you're likely to get cancer. And if you drink excessively, you're likely to get in trouble and do dumb things. Right, Joe? We all make mistakes, and there are consequences in this life. In fact, Jesus talked about that. He said some people receive consequences for their actions in this life. There are consequences. But when we sin... In the spirit world, in God's eyes, we are immediately forgiven and cleansed by the blood. That's why it says there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk in the spirit. No condemnation. So when condemnation comes, well, here's an important distinction. When we sin, you can rest assured conviction will come. Right? Who does the convicting? The Holy Spirit. Because God's Spirit is on the inside of us, and when we sin and fall short, His Spirit will speak to our spirit, and that's conviction. The other thing that happens when you sin and make a big mistake is condemnation. What is the source of condemnation? <clears throat> God said, I will not condemn you, Romans 8. I do not condemn you. Condemnation does not come from God. So who does it come from? The other guy. Satan is the accuser of the brother. He accuses you before God, and even more devastating, he accuses us in our minds. Satan is the accuser. And here's how you can know the difference. Well, I should say there's another source of condemnations. The Bible says, happy is the man who does not condemn himself over the things that he's done. So we got, two, we got three sources. God, he, he won't condemn us. Satan is the accuser. He always is there to condemn us. And too often we condemn ourselves. And here's how to know the difference between conviction and condemnation. The Holy Spirit has a still, small voice. When you've done something or sinned against God or, or disobeyed, the Holy Spirit will speak to you gently. Jim, that was wrong. Jim, you need to ask for forgiveness. Jim, you need to stop doing that. The Holy Spirit is a still, small voice. The Holy Spirit is standing there beckoning you to come to Him. 
That's the Holy Spirit. The opposite is true for the devil. The devil is a screamer. The Holy Spirit is quiet. The devil is loud. The devil will say, Joe, you've done something dumb. Jim, you're an idiot. How stupid. Jim, you're not a Christian. How can a Christian do that? Jim, you failed. God will never use you again after you've done that. See, the Satan is a screamer. He's loud and he's pushy. The Holy Spirit leads. Does anybody here grew up on a farm where you drive cattle? When I was a little boy, my dad would have me go down the lane, go out to the pasture, and herd or drive the cattle. In fact, the Old West called it a cattle drive. They would drive the cattle because they had to manipulate, encourage, intimidate sometimes them to go in a direction. That's Satan. He's a pusher. He drives. Can you drive sheep? No. Right. <laughs> you have to lead sheep. We are the sheep of his pasture, and he leads by his gentle voice. He leads the Holy Spirit. You can do better. It's like when a little child falls. We don't kick them when they're down. We pick them up. You can do this. Come on. Try again. We encourage them. Satan was the one that would kick you when you're down. You need to know the difference between conviction and condemnation. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We have forgiveness. I want to finish two more. Number nine, the blood brings those who were far away near. Now, right now, that's an important word in this verse, Ephesians 2, 13. Now, in Christ Jesus, we who sometimes were far off are made near by the blood of Christ. Sometimes we were far off because we were born in sin. We were the children of the devil. We were born and destined and on our way to be condemned in hell forever. We were far off from God. See, Adam had fellowship with God, walked with him in the garden. But when he sinned, fellowship was broken. He was cast out. Two angels with flaming swords were there to make sure they didn't get back in. They were cast out. When Cain sinned, killed his brother Abel, he was cast out. And a mark was put on him, and he was cast out, separated from family and from God. Sin separates. Paul said that in other places. Your sins have separated you from God. Sin causes separation. We have a holy God, and, and we are to be holy as he is holy. And we were separated from God. But it says the blood restores that fellowship. See, forgiveness without relationship is empty. It's hollow. I think I used this example years ago. But if I got mad at my youngest daughter, Kim, who was a feisty teenager, or it could be other things. I've had people ask me, you know, I, what do I do? I just found out one of my children is gay. You know what my answer was? Love them. Don't cast them out. Don't separate. Love them. Because condemnation doesn't lead people to a relationship with your Jesus Christ. Love does. God so loved, he gave. And love is what draws people back. Now abides these three things, it says, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Against such there is no power that is stronger or greater. If you want to win somebody to Christ, Love them. Love. I just had a thought. It's like Spider-Man in that movie. You, you know, remember? He, and he sends out this web, and it just keeps pulling and drawing them in. That's the goal of fishing. You know, you get a hook in their mouth, and you just keep pulling. But you don't want to pull too hard. Or you, what happens, Joe, if you pull too hard? You need to pull the hook out of their mouth, break the line, or... Bad things happen if you pull, but you want a gentle 
pull. See, the Holy Spirit, the love of God is a gentle pull. If you want to help win somebody to Christ, love them. I don't care what it is. Love. Love. If my daughter did something terrible and I said, okay, Kim, I'll forgive you, but I want you to leave my home and never come back. How meaningful would that be to her or to me? Forgiveness by itself is awesome and wonderful as it is. We've been saved from hell. But if we had not been restored to fellowship, it would be meaningless. Sin separated us and we were far from God, but now the blood has restored us to fellowship. In the Old Testament, when they anointed the young men to become priests, they put blood on their forehead, cleanse their minds, blood on their hands. They put blood on their bodies. On their toes. Even on their toes, you're right, Billy. And it was a sign to give them the privilege to go back into the presence of God and minister as God's servant. It's the blood covering that gives us the privilege to be restored back to fellowship with the Father. It restores relationship. So genuine forgiveness would say, not only, Kim, I forgive you. Kim, I want you to come home. An example of that's the prodigal father. The prodigal son. We, we call it the story of the parable of the prodigal son, but the real hero in that is the father who let his son go and, and live a life of sin but continued to love him, to pray for him. And as soon as he saw his son making steps to come back, he ran to meet him, put his arms around him. Didn't say, that was the dumbest thing you ever did. Why in the world did you waste all the... He put his arms around him and said, oh, thank you, son. I'm so glad you're home. My son, which was dead, is now alive. Here, let me put my coat on you. Take my ring. Let's have a celebration. That's what love is, restoration. Back into the family, back into fellowship. One more I want to cover this morning, number 10. It brings peace and reconciliation. Colossians 1.20. Talking about his blood. Having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things to himself. That's what I was talking about, reconciliation, to bring back into the family. Reconcile means two people that were having this huge argument and division. These family members that hadn't spoken for years are restored back. That's what God wants with us. That's what he wants with us in our relationships to end the war. See, as long as we were on Satan's side, we were the enemies of God. Paul called us, we once were the enemies of God. But when you reconcile with Jesus Christ by receiving his cleansing in his blood, the war is over. The peace agreement is signed. And it restores fellowship, living together again in harmony. Have you ever gone to bed at night when you've had a little tiff with your wife or your husband? And you're still angry at him. And you're laying there in the same bed and you're only three feet apart. But boy, in your mind... It's like your world's apart. Because those feelings of animosity bring distance, separate us. And if you harbor on ill feelings, people get further and further and further apart. But the blood of Christ brings peace, peace. Not only peace, not only an agreement, okay, we're going to stop fighting. But Jesus said, from now on, I want to make you my friends. From now on, I want you to be my bride. From now on, I want to have intimate fellowship with you. The blood of Christ is such an awesome thing. Use it, apply it in your life every day. Go through this list and try to memorize or pick two or three and apply them to your lives every day and, and meditate on these. It's the blood of Christ. It's the foundation of everything that we have. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the blood that was shed for our salvation. Lord, I thank you that you are willing to come and give your life to be the ransom for our sin. 
Lord, I thank you that you paid the price for our redemption. Father, I'm so very grateful for your goodness and mercy to us in Christ Jesus. Thank you for pardon. Thank you for reconciliation. Thank you for fellowship. Thank you that you loved us. You've bought and paid for us with the purpose of taking us to be home with you for eternity. Lord, I thank you for the blood of Christ. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me of my sin because that gives me access to fellowship with you. Lord, thank you for all those that are here today. May your blessing be upon them, rest upon them. Lord, guide us and direct us in truth, I pray. I thank you for it. I receive it in Jesus' name. All agree, say, Amen. Amen. Oh, God, so love the world.